Are you a diver and you maybe even take photos or videos underwater? Then this live stream is for you. Because we believe that everyone who takes images underwater is already an ocean ambassador. And to make sure that you can do your job properly and inspire people out there to care for the ocean and eventually protect it, we collected your questions beforehand on social media and we're going to ask those questions to creative professionals from the industry. And we are sending live from the world's largest water sports show here in Düsseldorf, the boat show, which is taking place from 18th to 26th of January. You're going to find us live in Hall 11 at the Pixel World workshop stage. Make sure you follow us on social media, on the Behind the Mask Facebook page and on the Behind the Mask YouTube channel. Turn on your notifications and most importantly, ask your questions down in the comments and maybe we will even be able to pick up your question and forward your question to our guest. And one more thing, by leaving us a comment, you already have a chance to win amazing prizes. Like the trip to Lembe from the guy sitting here again. You've been here this morning. Hi, Simon. How are you? Everything fine? Oh, good. Thank you. Very good. Very good. What are we doing today? What would you like to talk about? Uh, it's a general mishmash of macro, photo, video, which also spills into Blackwater because that was my latest hobby for the last 18 months was shooting predominantly Blackwater. Um, but it's just a general mishmash of sort of diving in the Lembe Strait and um, macro photography. So yeah, black water diving. Um, this is a montage of, I don't know, it, it came from about three or four dives in like a really hot period that we had. Um, so black water diving is where you go um, out, not necessarily into super deep water, um, and you hang some lights and then you wait for the plankton to attract, so you get a big cloud of not very good stuff, but then in between that, your dive guide or you when your eyes get used to it, you start to find the more beautiful things. And then as that cloud grows, you get bigger and bigger animals coming. Um, if the wind's blowing a little bit and you're drifting, um, then you might drift into things like the nice jellyfish and things like that. The big misconception about blackwater diving is about current. Like, yeah, you might get unlucky and you have a bit of turbulence in the water, but in general, because you're moving at the same speed as the water, there's not really any current. Um, if you do, a, say, a bonfire dive where you're on the sand, then, yeah, there may be a current going past. Or if you have a strong wind, then you're going to you call it bonfire? Bonfire. It's where you put the <coughs> lights on the sand, and then you, it looks like a bonfire from far away because you have a big cloud of, of plankton. So for people who are a little more nervous about drifting over an unknown depth, it's a nice way to get them started. And you also see different things, like close to the reef and the sand, you'll see more larval fish species coming down to settle in the sand and things like that. So like the uh, little lionfish, the eels, flounders, they'll where, be where, closer the to shore. Uh, I don't here. see the lionfish. Oh, yeah, yeah. Looking straight at you. Yeah. Oh, nice. Next to the little goby, which is also there. Wow. But whereas if you go a bit more offshore, you get the nautilus riding the jellyfish, mm -hmm. uh, paper nautilus or an argonaut. Uh, and you get the big blanket octopus, if you're lucky. Diamond squid in the top right is an awesome critter. Um, so yeah, black water diving, you're looking for all that kind of stuff. Do you know all the stuff that you get in front of your camera? Or is it like because people say that there's a lot of things coming by and you don't really know what I it is? I think if I go on a black water dive, let's say I do two in one night, I'm a little bit disappointed now if I don't find something new. Really? Because my eyes have got so used to like, oh, I know what that is, I know what that isn't. Ah, okay, okay, so you specifically look out so for So just for, for me, these. like, there's obviously, like, I'm from Lembe, another popular macro destination is Anadau, and we have this little fun thing where, like, oh, they've seen that, oh, no, we need to find it now, and vice versa, you know? So it's good, healthy competition amongst people who are in the dive industry a lot, because, I mean, you, I've been in Lembe for 12 years now, diving quite often, so you do tend to pick little things that you freak out on and go, okay, I'm going to do black water now and I'm going to find all this new stuff. How, how big is this stuff? Is it like tiny? Uh, the blanket octopus in the middle maybe is like this long when it's stretched out. Oh, really? Wow. Um, and then the little goby, the orange one there is only tiny, say, say a centimeter long. So you're shooting typically a 60 millimeter lens. I use a Nikon D850, so it's 50 megapixels, so I can crop in on the tiny stuff. I used to take a diopter. But then I found like messing around and having extra weight on the camera and the diopters, I might as well just crop the image. Um, some people would say that's cheating. 
but it's oh, okay. Come on, I mean, is it like is it technically difficult to photograph something? Because I assume they're not like lit up like this. Like you have to uh, come it's up with everything. A combination, obviously, with the shinier subjects like the jack. I actually slightly overexposed it, but I could save it in Photoshop. When you see like bright reflective subjects, you have to adjust your lighting more from the side so that you're not just getting it blasting back in your face. Um, and then other things which are more transparent, let's say like the little baby frogfish here, you try and put some light from the back to make it shine. How do you put light from the back when you're like free in the water? I have a, like a strobe on like an extendable strobe arm so I can just extend it out and put it behind aiming back a little bit. Blinding yourself. Yeah, <laughs> but it's on low power. <laughs> wow, that's cool. And um, so you're not using any or you're not utilizing any of the light that is there because you're attracting all of these animals with a huge source of light. Yeah, you want all of the not so good stuff to go to the big lights and not to your focus light on your camera because then you start getting a cloud around your camera. You have to turn the light off, swim away, turn it back on again. Like if you drift too close to the lights and then you start picking up the plankton at the back, it can get quite frustrating. So, I mean, these images have a lot of Photoshop on them to oh, okay. take away the backscatter. They look really beautiful, like yeah. especially the montage when everything comes together, all the different colors yeah. and everything is like transparent. And I think you can even see the brain or the guts of the... Yeah, I mean, I bought a... It's amazing. I was generously, I bought, I, I was given permission to buy a large printer that's about this size, a 44 inch wide printer. So I printed this out this size and have it up on the wall. It looks really good. It's, uh, wow. Nice. It's really cool. Uh, and it's interesting, even if you've been diving there for a long time to do something new. A lot of people go to a destination for five, six, seven years and they say, oh, I've seen everything. And then, then we find something new. Ah, so. I see. Okay. Great. Um, we prepared a lot of uh, questions from the community for you. And I think we just jump in between some pictures and some examples of your work and some different kind of techniques. And uh, we start with a question from who tipped my cows? Amazing <laughs> name. Uh, is it better to shoot manual focus or out of focus for macro? It's quite a variable thing. Like, I mean, it depends what camera you have to begin with. I mean, if you have a camera that's capable of manual focus and you're able to control it, then I would still say 90% of the time for a still photograph, you should use autofocus because the technology now is so good. Like when I first started with film cameras, like with the F90, old Nikon stuff, it was like super slow with a really crinkly old lens and things. Nowadays, the cameras are so good, I think better to use autofocus. But let's say in the Blackwater scenario, I'm using autofocus, then just pulling it a little bit closer, because otherwise the focus is on the body and not the eye. Ah, I see. It's like a little thing. And it's the same like with shooting gobies or whatever on the sand. You want to maybe use both. There's no hard, fast rule on which you should use, except for video. Video, I would say, I would always use manual focus, because I hate it when you're focused on something and then the focus starts to drift into the background where there's more contrast, say, in a bit of coral or something. And it, you, you can see it hunting and moving. Yeah. Um, yeah. AF lock would also work for that. Like you let it get focused in, but then you're having to hold onto it. And then maybe the camera starts to shake as you're holding the buttons for too long. Ah, I see. Okay, so what we have to clarify here, guys, is that we talk about <coughs> photography and videography basically at the same time, because you're doing both. Yes. So I think we uh, just try to mention when it's about photo and mm -hmm. when it's about uh, video. Before, when Evan was here, it was all about video, and now we have different disciplines and photo and video basically at the same time. Okay. Um, I think this one is also kind of a little bit about uh, focusing. This is, yeah, because right. at the beginning, this is just an example of how manual focus can also work against you. So this is the blanket octopus one we're talking about in the middle. This is shot with a 50 millimeter lens on a red 8K helium. Um, and the problem is, of course, if you both, because I'm in the water moving and the octopus is moving and I'm trying to use manual focus. So instead of just being the standard scenario of usually you are still and the subject is moving, um, with macro, it's a 50 mil lens, so you don't have the depth of field of a wide angle lens. So you are struggling a little bit to, to keep up with which way you should be spinning because maybe you're going towards it or you're going away from it. Um, and it was just a cool shot of a very rare animal. Um, this is slightly sped up. I shot this wow. at, I don't know, around 70 frames a second um, to be able to slow it down a little bit. Is it slowed down? Uh, it's half speed for half some speed. of it. 
Yeah, this wow. is the kind of stuff I really lose my patience after like 10 seconds. Yeah, can you imagine trying to film this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, you can see also here all the backscatter that gets deleted in still photographs. So when you see Blackwater still photographs, <laughs> all that oh, little fluff has yeah. been clicked away. Ah, okay, yeah. So this is sort of natural. This is kind of how you would see it. Because these guys, they come into the, the plume of plankton that gets attracted to the lights and mm -hmm. feed on things. The blanket is actually full of stinging cells. They harvest cell, uh, stinging cells from jellyfish um, and use them for their own defense. And obviously, if you annoy them enough, like I did, they show their blanket. So you can, uh, you can is argue that the same that, animal. Yeah. So you can argue that it's not natural behavior because it's doing that because I'm there, because it's scared of me. But at the same time, it won't do it if you're not there. So it'll, yeah. You know, what's the right thing to do? I'm not sure. But uh, I saw it, so I thought, well, I, and I swam up to it, and it did that. And uh, this, to begin with, I was shooting. This is the exact same animal as the still picture. So I went back up went back into my camera room, changed my camera, and then got back in again, it was still there. Um, so then I was whoa, able whoa, to shoot whoa, the video. What do you mean it's still there? It was just by the lights. I was still by the lights. Just having a free snack. It's, uh, is this, is, uh, I, I, I feel super stupid, because I've never seen anything like uh, this. Is this, is, this a just, like, is this an octopus? With it's an octopus, but it never touches the bottom. Mm -hmm. It always stays in the water column. Um, a guy called Mike Bartik in the Philippines, he got a shot of one like holding its egg cluster. So they just drift through the ocean. So they're not resident anywhere. They just follow their food. So when you get a particular rich plankton bloom, getting, you get the ocean gyrus collecting plankton and also trash. You'll see that they, sometimes you get collections of trash that you see on the news. Underneath that is full of plankton um, because the, the ocean water circulates and collects it. And then as it collects up, then these other animals come through. And then eventually that gets put on shore and ends up, you know, say, in the Lembe Strait where we are. And then we can try and track it. So oh, okay. that we will then follow where the plankton uh, collection is. Beautiful animal. Wow. Yeah. Okay, cool. Hori wants to know, how did you take a video um, of those animals that stuck at the precise moments, uh, struck at the precise moments to their uh, prey? Like, is it like about hunting? Like when you f want to film something that you don't really know that's coming up and how do you actually uh, set up it? Did you leave a camera behind running and came back for it later? Or can you describe how you took the clip of the squid feeding on something? Okay, yeah. Uh, so I think let's illustrate a little bit on the side what it actually yeah. is about. So the old fashioned way of doing this stuff was to leave your camera running on a tripod, shooting say 60 frames a second. If you, could, if you were lucky enough to have one that, that shot that high. Normally it was 25, 30p. Um, and then you, know, you can shoot it for like 25 minutes and you just hope Damn. when you get back that you, you get something. Um, these are shot with something called a Phantom Flex, which shoots 1,000 frames a second. I think these were actually at 2,000 frames a second in 2, HD. 2,000 frames wow. a second? Yeah. <laughs> so what's that, okay. for 40 times slower than life speed? And it's still too slow, really. You need, it needs a bit slower. Um, so yeah, that's... I'm lucky that I, my wife grants me such a camera budget. Um, <laughs> most people don't get away with that. Um, so you, I've been able to play around doing these sort of silly projects and looking for, for the, the coolest behavior. This is the cuttlefish, not a squid. Um, but basically, yeah, you can leave your camera running and hope, but it's better to be there. Like on my Phantom, I have a release. So on the Phantom and the RED cameras, you can do something called pre-record. I think you can also do it now on the GH5 from Panasonic, I'm not sure. Um, and I have a little remote release so I can get back a little bit away from the action um, and then press the button when the action happens and it will record the last five seconds, let's say, onto the okay, memory so card. Okay, so it's basically storing something for it's all the time? It's constantly shooting, so it gets deleting. very hot. Like storing and deleting and storing and yeah. deleting and once you hit it, then it stops deleting and saves and the saves last five However seconds. much it has in the history. Okay. Uh, I see. And then it also records forward. It depends where you, where you set it. Um, But the problem with that is you're running a camera for sometimes an hour and a half. And let's say with the red, I mean, that's with two batteries on the back, you're, you're running out of battery. So you have to pick and choose when you want to, yeah. to do this pre-record function or if you just want to, to give it a try. Uh, it's I also, I think, I mean, you're aware of this in the, in the red cameras, you can't delete anything you've shot in camera. If you leave it running for 10 minutes by mistake, if you do that accidental record whilst you're swimming around, The, the memory's gone. You have to come up, take the card out, put it in a computer, and then delete it. So it, uh, you have to be careful and manage how you're using your battery and your memory card. Okay, and, uh, now if you uh, give a recommendation for someone who doesn't have access to this kind of camera gear. Yeah. Um, 
the cool ones I've seen so far are the TG5 has a slow-mo mode and the iPhone. If you had an iPhone housing, you can actually shoot some quite cool slow-mo with, um, with a light. And basically, you know, ask your guide. I mean, this was the same animal that was in Blue Planet 2, I think. Um, and we were out doing a shoot looking at that. And in the, there was a Disney nature film as well where they used some of these uh, um, cuttlefish. Um, and we basically knew that this one had got sort of habituated. It was used to people having video lights on it. It didn't care. You know, it, it just came around and it was really happy with us. So that was fine. This one was on my house reef. And we just saw, looked over the side of the, the jetty and saw there was all of these um, urchins with the Bangai cardinal fish. And, oh, and there's a spearing mantis shrimp. So you just go down there. I mean, of course, you being there is influencing the situation. Um, but in the end, I mean, you, you see mantis shrimp strike a lot. When you live there, it's like, normally as a tourist, you sort of swim past them and ignore them. But when you're living there, you can really spend some time and like, I spent a day, probably two, two, three days to get these shots. Um, the cuttlefish was a, was a day. The blue ring eggs hatching was two or three days. Um, okay. So yeah, I mean, it's about anticipation, taking your time and then with the camera, if you can get something that can shoot super slow motion, then you can, you can start playing around with it. Are you selling this? Some of it, yeah. Um, I've used some stock agencies in the US, but I use it mostly for the diving side of my business to attract film crews. Oh, I see. OK, cool. Interesting. I live somewhere where visibility is basically always terrible. Could be. Germany just getting into underwater <laughs> videography and there are still loads of awesome small mm. critters in the sea I'd love to get some macro shots off any advice on equipment or lighting or any tips to make my shots clearer and easier to get would be appreciated yeah I mean this is the same in the Lembe Strait here's another shot just phew, that's a different speeds and you can see that if you have a bad day, it's basically a wasted day. All of that fluff and backscatter in the water there. Um, that can be your own fault. If you're setting the camera up and you accidentally put your hand down in the silt and it goes up, if you're in a bay with not much current, that's it. You're waiting for an hour maybe for it to clear up again. So the first thing we always explain to divers when they come muck diving somewhere like the Lembe Strait is be a good diver. Like maybe on the first dive of the day, on the first dive of your holiday, don't take your camera. Don't kick up the silt, get used to diving again. Then start taking your camera. And once you're comfortable and you're not like worried about things. Also, don't put too many things on your camera to begin with. Don't have three diopters, a tripod, a poking stick, all this other stuff, you know, like it's, it's too much stuff. So just concentrate on being a, a Zen diver that's relaxed. And then it comes down to lighting, um, you know, my lighting here is the Phantom. You have to use lots of light, so the lighting is quite poor. I've highlighted all the backscatter. Um, so I would, on a still photograph, for example, I would put my strobes out to the side to try and avoid lighting any of the backscatter that's in the way. Um, I think that's a key thing, is how you approach the animal and how you set up your equipment. You can make the best of a bad situation. You can, like, for example, in still photography, you can use a snoot. There's some images coming up later on. So you basically put a spot of light over the subject, which means there's no light on any of the other backscatter. So then you can make a clean image. So if you have like shitty water around, don't yeah, illuminate don't, it. Yeah, don't just don't put the light on it and don't stir anything up. No, oh, okay. No, okay. Make makes sense. Usually macro subjects are standing in crowded backgrounds or something reflecting, sometimes reflecting uh, backgrounds like white sand. Of course, this happens less on the black sand of Lembe, but in 90% of other cases, it is difficult in your photo or video to make a subject stand out. Do you have any special techniques for, subjects, for subject isolation that are applicable to underwater macro so that your image and video can real pop? I'll do video first. Mm -hmm. So like with video, it's always tempting with macro video to say like, ah, I need to get as much in focus as possible. So I'm going to use a high f-stop with more depth of field. And then you put it up too high. And then you're starting to get the backscatter in front and behind you in focus and also the background. So you have to start getting more comfortable and trust your focusing abilities to use a smaller aperture. I'll shoot around f5.6, f8 for most of my macro stuff um, 
because then you're getting the background maybe slightly blurred so you can still see what's in the background to tell the story of where the animal lives but it's just enough out of focus that it doesn't distract you from the the foreground subject um, i think there's a video clip just a little simple one of a frogfish <clears throat> so if the coral in the background was um, lit up uh, and, and in slightly in focus it would distract away from what the frogfish is doing so you want to pick an aperture that allows you to see a little bit of the background but not too much so you isolate the subject from the background it's obviously easier say in a shot like this where the background is further away you can still shoot a high f-stop because it's it's blurred anyway but you get a nicer quality blur when the f f aperture is uh, lower five six eight eleven are, are good places to start mm -hmm. but yeah I mean, it's also important to show where the animal lives like don't try and unless you're particularly going for that style yeah. I like to see where it lives it lives in a bit of weed and next to a, a sea urchin and stuff like that so you don't want to get rid of the background entirely you want to still show where yeah. the animal lives and, and, and what it's doing okay cool about photography yeah so this one is actually a cheat this is a low f-stop image but it's actually slightly blurred in Photoshop so I wanted to be honest about that from the start. If you're skilled enough in Photoshop, you can save an image where you're not quite happy with it. I still I shot it with a low f-stop, but th these white spots in the background, they were a little bit too blingy. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make it like a, just a complete blur. So I did some okay. layering in Photoshop and isolated the subject out of there. Mm -hmm. But you have to pick your backgrounds for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I've got the other shots coming up in a little while. Again here, this is a little Pontohi pygmy seahorse. Um, I was lucky that we found it in such a way that it was sticking out and I could get the blue uh, background behind it. So that, just by changing the angle I was shooting, if I was shooting towards the coral, then you'd have all the coral in the background, which would look messy. But by this one, I could get underneath and have the blue, blue water above it. So that allowed me just to isolate it. So it's not necessarily about photographic technique to isolate your subject. It's about picking your angle and mm -hmm. thinking about your approach. Mm -hmm. So then a different seahorse, but this one you want the background because you want to show where it lives because it's so beautiful. Um, this one, the polyps are all sticking out and nice. That's because nobody's tried to poke or prod or touch the, the, the pygmy seahorse. You see a lot of photos where the sea fan is, all the polyps have gone in. Mm -hmm. the sea fans naturally do have the polyps in for several times of the day when they're not feeding. But the sort of aficionado of macro photography, you want it to be with the polyps out so it looks at its most beautiful. Um, and much more difficult to get. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to wait, pick your time. I mean, now I go in the water, I don't even bother with them because like, the guests want to shoot it. So I'm like, ah, I'll leave it. And I try and refresh my images maybe every five years. Um, but now they're, it's a good one to, it's a good com uh, juxtaposition against the previous photo where you try and avoid the background to one where you actually want the background. Mm -hmm. This is using a snoot that I mentioned briefly earlier with bad visibility. A snoot can help a lot because that sort of light beam coming down from the top. Can you explain the snoot a little bit? The what snoot, it is like in the old days, we just used to use drain pipe. So you just like make an adapter duct tape on a, a bit of drain pipe, like a two inch pipe to onto your strobe. Like point and channel the light. Yeah, it's only just, it focuses the light on that one particular area. Mm -hmm. um, like a spotlight. Yeah, so it gives you a very tight beam. Nowadays, you can buy torches that are snoot lights. You can buy uh, lenses and adapters that fit on your strobes. You can buy strobes that already have them built in. And this cuts down on your backscatter. So like maybe there was a couple of clicks in the back that I needed to get rid of. Um, and then it focuses your light beam onto the side. I had two different versions of this shot. One where it was just the flamboyant cuttlefish and the background had no light but it didn't give any depth to the image. It looked like I'd just like taken a mask in Photoshop and deleted the rest. So I preferred this shot with a little bit of the background in there. Mm -hmm. And angle matters? Yes, uh, so this is a shot of some little um, Shaun the Sheep nudibranchs, Costa Sierra. Um, they live on these little tiny algae. This thing is about five millimeters long. And that shot is two of them. It's nice. It shows them as a pair, for example. But you can see I've used a high f-stop because the, the blurred out sections still have circles in them. So it's slightly in focus, which I didn't like. So instead of trying to change my settings, you can just sort of change your angle. And as I change my angle, I got another leaf in the background. I changed my f-stop to be much lower. So I think, about, I think that's actually the green of the water. That's how bad the visibility is. And then it just transforms the image just by changing your angle. Um, 
it can be a uh, like that's sort of the first shot with the double that's like what you get with somebody sort of level one macro diver with their compact camera just sort of having fun and taking a few shots and then the next photo is when you really think about it a bit more and take a bit more time wait for the right moment um, it makes a huge difference in the pictures that you take it's cool how this is like the same I don't the think it's, it's not the exact same one. It was like on the same dive. They're, they're, yeah. they're in the shallows. They're really cool. They're very common oh. on certain dive sites. Oh. So this is back to the other guy. So the, the background was originally like this. Um, so the first one, I, bl I had this similar angle, and I blurred the background out a little bit more input in the computer. This is how it naturally is. And I still like it. I mean, on this, when you look at it this big, it's so different to looking at it on your phone, on Facebook, or, or whatever. It's like... It really changes how you appreciate your photography when you look at something on a big screen, which I think is something I'll come to later when we're chatting. Um, and then the next shot, I think, hopefully, this is a back and forth one. So on the first, this one, I got a better behavior with the yawn. And then on the previous one, the background was a little bit too bright. So it was sort of a progression as I went through the, the dive work. I worked with this one subject for an hour. Um, I did go on a dive on my, my own without any of the other guests, so I could really concentrate. It's a very shy animal, very rare. Um, and I was able to try all the different settings. Um, so with this one, there's a lot more light in the back. This one here, I, I reduced the light in the back, changed my f-stop, and I got the best behavior on this one, but I kind of like that high key image on the previous one. So it's, again, what do you prefer? Do you want to make a series of images with this sort of high key white background? Do you like having snoots with black backgrounds? Do you want to have natural shots with all of the, 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 the habitat in the background? It depends what story you're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people come on holiday and they don't have a purpose. So they come and they say like, hey, what can I shoot? And it's like, well, you, anything you want. What do you want to shoot? Oh, I don't know. So like try and have something in your head before you go on holiday. Like pick a few images, steal a few off Facebook, save them. Like I want to try and get this. And you can explain it then to your dive guide as well and say like, I'm after these let me copy these shots in the first few days, find me these animals, I'll try and replicate, maybe improve on what you've seen somebody else do. And then after that, you've got a style, then maybe have that one style for, your, for that particular holiday, dive vacation, and then try something different the next time. Mm -hmm. I think if you're too all over the place, then you, you, at the end of the holiday, you're having a beer and looking through your pictures and you're like, I'm not happy with anything because it doesn't match whatever else you've been doing. Mm -hmm. But that's also part of the video brain. Like the video brain is very different to the still photography brain. Because on the video, you want everything to link together and look similar, have the same lighting, so it cuts together. Whereas as a still photographer, you sometimes forget that and you just sort of blast away and don't mm -hmm. really have a theme. Mm -hmm. This uh, subject isolation, so this was, I was just coming up, I think it was Christmas Day even, I was coming up from a dive and I just saw this beautiful hole in the coral with this eel sticking out getting clean. And I was like, well, that's just, there's no snoot on that, there's no fancy equipment, it's just two strobes normally just faced in a little bit. And the coral on the side was creating the shadow around the eel. So this is basically as it was shot, there's no photo trickery on there. But it just means you can isolate something, you can effectively have the purpose of a snoot just from the natural environment around the animal. So a nudibranch lying on the sand, if you've got a bit of coral to the side, you can put your strobe slightly behind it and it'll cast a shadow. So don't just think about the light that you're producing, think about the shadows that you're casting as well. So you want to try and balance and manage both. Light positioning, I assume? This is heavily Photoshop, not to change the behavior or anything, it's just to make it more uh, contrasty and high key. So this is a strobe behind the animal, just like laying on the sand, just disconnected it from my camera. And then have one at the front just for a little bit of fill. And then basically you go into Photoshop and drag your sliders to make the most contrast and the most impact. Um, so that completely isolates the frogfish from the background. You don't know where it is, there's no story there. You show that to a non-diver, they don't know where that thing lives, they, they, there's no story in it, but it's in sort of a different artistic style. So I was doing a few of these because I see people shooting snoots and I'm like, ah, oh, I'll give it a shot. This one was just with a torch. So just like your normal diving hand torch with a slightly tight beam turned off my strobes and then just held it sort of in my camera and, and took the shot on my own. With snooting with a torch, it's much nicer if you have a nice dive guide who can hold it for you. Mm -hmm. But as the boss, I don't get that privilege. So I have to do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> what are the best 
tips for finding rare animal behavior, like mating, feeding, and so on? Is it a specific time of the day, just luck, or are you looking for some specific hints an animal might give you beforehand? All of the, I mean, it's, it's just knowledge. It's either your knowledge from seeing things on the internet and asking questions. Um, I would suggest if you're wanting to find things out like that, ask in a private direct message because certain things, it's like you hear about the safaris where they ask you to remove geotagging now if you see a rhino because someone's going to see it on the internet and follow it. It's not quite that bad with diving, but if you were to say where you found something on Facebook, maybe the next day somebody else goes, oh, I'm going to find it there, and then they go and they look too hard, you know? It's, uh, so ask people privately, um, find out you know, how they did something, what they did. Um, say like with this octopus there, we, uh, we went for six days in a row, we saw it had eggs and we just kept going back and just checking and you have the whole sequence of it developing from sort of an embryo all the way through to it hatching. Um, in the end, I realized that octopus, they hatch their eggs at dusk. Because, I mean, it makes sense. Why would they hatch them in the daytime? Because they're just going to get eaten straight away. So little things like the hairy frogfish mates at dusk as well. Because, again, they just want to release the eggs at the best possible time. And it's funny how that one, that ties into blackwater diving. Because then you see the egg masses floating through the water as you're doing the blackwater dives. And then you realize the calendar that they have for when they're going to do it. Um, so yeah, I mean, pick an experienced dive center um, who knows sort of what to look for, how to look for it. And also, you know, I mean, pick ones that are environmentally friendly as well because you don't want to be aggressively looking for things because that just makes you stressed as a photographer as well because you're seeing stuff maybe that you're not happy with. Um, take your time. I mean, this is pretty easy. I mean, you know, the crabs and stuff and mantis shrimp, they're always fighting. It's like a constant battle in the shallows. <laughs> they hate each other, it's quite funny. <laughs> um, but the more sort of things like the Bangai cardinal fish with eggs, the cardinal fish always have eggs. Um, in the Lembe Strait, the Nemo's clownfish, they always have eggs and they typically always have parasites in their mouth. So you can find behavior that's sort of easy to get into it. Because it, again, it's a completely different mindset. It's like the video, you're spending a whole dive on one subject. So you have to be prepared to make that gamble on your holiday that if you're going for a week, maybe you might waste one of your 15 dives or whatever you're planning on doing. Um, so yeah, it depends how, you, how much time you want to invest because you don't get anything for free. It's all, you know, you've got to think about the cost of getting there, your cost of the dive, the time underwater. Are you wanting to rush around real quick and get a picture of everything or you want to slow, slow down and go for gold, I guess? I don't know, it depends on your mindset. but. Basically, diving with somebody who's experienced, somebody who's seen it before, maybe. If you want to look for something new, ask a lot of questions. Um, scientists can be really helpful when you're looking for new behavior on, on certain things. So basically, it's social media nowadays makes it so much more accessible. Preparation yes. is the key. Absolutely. OK. I have a couple of questions. Firstly, what tips do you have for making macro footage less shaky and more stable? And secondly, when filming macro, often we are using super strong lights and very tiny creatures. How can we minimize the impact this has on the animals and their environment slash behavior? Right, I'll start with the first one. I mean, shaky and stable, like I said, um, we can... Um, Make it better by using a tripod, for example, resting your camera on the floor. Um, but again, being a good diver, maybe throw away, be prepared to throw away the first day of footage um, and just really concentrate. There was a question that was posted this morning about using tripods and impact with the coral in the environment. We spend months researching locations for film crews where they can put their massive tripods facing a coral reef but on sand. Like the preparation that goes into looking for those spots where you can do that. You, you can't do that when you're just on a, a one-week vacation. They're there for six weeks, and they just go back to that same spot every time um, because that's what they want to have in the background. And when filming macro, I don't use strong lights. I use, because I'm trying to balance with the sun. I want to have a blue background usually to show the environment where the animal lives, so my lights are on very low. I use very powerful lights because I want the big battery power, but I use them on the lowest setting. So like on those, the, the Keldons that I have, it's all the way down on the lowest power, typically, unless I use the Phantom. But when I put the phantom with the super strong lights, the animal hides and you have to condition it. You have to go back day after day or a whole day 
with the light to the point where it's like, ah, this guy's not going to leave. I'm just going to carry on, no, live, okay. my, live my life. Okay, <laughs> but it's not going to harm the animals or anything. No, I mean, as long as you're keeping an eye out, like if you're really highlighting an animal, let's say like a shrimp or something like that, just keep an eye out that a fish isn't coming in to eat it. So you spend your time sort of being the bouncer. It's the same mm -hmm. when you're filming octopus out and moving around. Sometimes a flounder comes in because he wants to bite the, the octopus. You have to just sort of... Yes, it would be natural for the flounder to eat the octopus, but you're sort of putting the octopus in a situation where he's highlighted, so it's better just to, mm. to make sure. Okay. Um, I I'm think too much, huh? no, this perfect. is a little bit about the <laughs> yeah, this was just light things. That's just our promo video, but don't worry about that. We're running out of time. That's Let's true. Go on to the next one. As always, often in places like Lembe, for example, when trying to film macro subjects in the shallows, I'm often plagued by flickering sunlight, which causes me all sorts of dramas. I have been toying with the idea of using a flexible gray balance reflector as an umbrella. Or do you strike this problem as well? Uh, if so, have you come up with any practical solution for that problem? Yeah, um, this is a video, just an example of some flickery footage, which it's not great. It was just something that was sort of in my sort of trash pile, but I, I didn't like the flickering, but actually now I'm looking back on it, I don't mind it so much. Um, but this is what Steve was talking about, that how it, it can be worse when you're doing macro because it will make something be so highlighted that you can't use the footage at all. Um, and then it goes so dark when you adjust it and you, you're playing a game back and forth. The comedy answer is you get a very big dive guide and you get him to float above you to block out the sun um, <laughs> or a big buddy. Um, with film crews, we use something called French flags. So it's about the size of your laptop and you basically have it on an arm and you put it above the subject just to create a little shallow uh, shadow. Um, you can do it with like super macro tiny stuff. You can just do it with your hand. And that just means you don't have the sunlight messing with your um, light. So in this situation, hopefully they come into focus. There you go. I quite like the background with the twinkly light. It makes it look sort of artistic, but not everybody wants that. So um, shooting in the shallows is challenging. I quite like it, but say like on a big production, you can't do that because maybe tomorrow and the next week you have clouds and the footage doesn't match because then the you don't realize it when you're just watching something, but when you're shooting it and you're putting the story together, you know the viewer's going to be shocked when it goes to the next shot and it's not got that same background effect. Oh, so okay. it spoils the illusion of the story. Mm -hmm. Okay. How important do you find high CRI lights for macro? Do you use manual focus on a tripod for most shoots? Let's stick to the first one. I think the second we already have, right? Yep. Find high CRI. So I, because of, of the answer. blackwater diving, I have over a million lumens of light. <laughs> um, because I'm not traveling with them, so I'm okay with the batteries. I just keep collecting them. It's like a hobby, a fetish. Um, <laughs> because I just want to make the light bigger and bigger and bigger for the black water. Um, so I have all the different ones from sort of the, the cheaper end of lights um, all the way to the super expensive Keldons and uh, Orca lights. And honestly, CRI, I wouldn't worry about it if I was just getting into it. It is definitely easier to edit your footage with high CRI lights because you just have that consistency. You know if you put it to 5,600 Kelvin, move the tint a little bit, all the footage is going to hit the same white point, which is very helpful. And then with high speed, you also have to watch out for the uh, PWM, the, the flickering of the lights. So like your, when LEDs first came out in your house, sometimes they would flicker a little bit or when they're starting to die, you have that same problem. It's sort of exacerbate with high speed and you see like a pulsing of blue, purple, yellow, blue, purple, yellow and stuff like that. So. Yes, it is important, but I would not place it as such a high level of importance that it would stop me from buying something and going on holiday. <laughs> what frame rate would you use if you wanted to make really slow motion shots with macro? Well, well if 2,000 frames um, a second is not enough. I'm 2,000 <laughs> all the way now. Um, I, you have to be careful. This The video I put up next, which you can start playing, is if you go too slow. Um, because it becomes boring. Like this guy's scratching his eye and it looks like, okay, yeah, that's how they do it. But normally this would be over in like, it would be super fast. So if you go too slow, it's also not good. So if I was a skilled editor like yourself, I would, you know, be doing funky zoom in, zoom out, speed up, slow down. <laughs> so I have the shot anyway for eventually when I learn how to use a computer. Um, 
but in the end, if it's too slow, it's just dull. So pick your speed based on what your subject is doing. Like with the strike, it's like interesting. Everyone's captivated the whole time. The mantis cleaning itself, it's not really necessary. You probably want to speed it up to make it sound look more comical. <coughs> Likewise here with the gills moving, I mean, you don't notice it when you're shooting at 30 frames a second, 25 frames a second. But at this super slow speed, you can see she's digging through the sand looking for the a bit of food or whatever or something to make her nest. So it does have a purpose to go as slow as possible, but don't get into the trap of doing it every time. How many frames a second is this? Uh, be a, around a thousand. And then, like four K. Yeah, no big deal. Thousand four K. Around. Oh, only four K. <laughs> well then. Hi, 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 hi. Do you have a recommended magnification level for a first diopter wetlands? Yeah. What do you make? Yeah. Oh, go on. Sorry. I don't know. Do, do, is it? Too, let me see. What? Would it make most sense to start low and then increase it yeah, once you are absolutely start with a low power? This is shot with a uh, SMC from Nordicam, so it's about the equivalent of like a 10 to 15 times diopter, and it becomes difficult because you can't focus. You lose your range of focus. The stronger the diopter, the closer you are. The less depth of field you have, the closer you also have to be to the subject to get your lighting in from the front. So. Start with like a plus five, a simple one. Um, there's the SMC2 from Naughty Cam. There's the Sub-C plus five. There's a few different options. There's loads of them, really. Uh, pick a good quality one that's not going to fill with water. The ones I've mentioned I've been using for years, and they're great. Um, and then really sort of just take your time, learn. Don't use it on every dive. Some people get into that habit of like, I'm on holiday. I'm going to take everything down diving with me, and I'm just going to use my strongest diopter. Um, do that if you dive a lot, but if you're just starting out, plus five is enough and take it slow. Good. Again, like diopters going right. In. These are some tiny little eggs that were next to the, um, the sheep nudibranch, some little goby eggs. Um, but yeah, that's getting up to like stacked diopters, shooting at sort of four to one macro. Um, it's quite specific and geeky and okay. they're not artistic shots. They're just sort of because you're interested in seeing the tiny stuff. Mm -hmm. Again, hairy shrimp as well. This is sort of also combines with the background thing. I shot this thing twice, put it on our Facebook. Which do you prefer, this one with a green background with a lower aperture and more background, or one with the strobe in the background with a pinkish background? And the contrast of this one was much nicer because people like to see backgrounds. Super cool, amazing. What do you <laughs> think that that mean? Not sure. What the photo? What the photo? It's oh. kind of a game that we want to play with you. Okay. Because we have a few photos from other photographers. Uh huh. Oh. Like this one uh, from Alex Mustard. Yeah. And now you uh, gotta come up with a correct answer. What is it and where is it? It's in the and Car he's like really. I mean, that's really like super that's difficult. That's in the Caribbean. What? How can? Because <laughs> I haven't seen it where I am. I've only <laughs> ever dived in the Pacific, so I know it's not. I'm pretty sure it's not there. It looks like an anthea or grouper from the shape of the head, but, or a basslet, but I wouldn't know what the species was. It's a Red Sea anthea in Jordan. Okay. Red Sea anthea. I, got anth I said anthea. Yeah. You give me that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. You get punched <laughs> for that for sure. Uh, this is Andrew Marriott, I'm guessing. Yes? Yeah. Well, you've got to guess the, 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 the animal. The ghost, <laughs> yeah. ghost pipefish. Yep. That's easy. Indonesia, but oh, that's uh, yeah. It's Australia. Is it? Mm. Somewhere down there. Do you know who shot it? No. It's a black and white artistic photograph. Christian Ah, it's Mexico then. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. No, it comes into <laughs> mind. I was just gonna say that. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's <laughs> Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it's some batfish, spadefish thing. Yes, from, from Mexico. Christian Vizzle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, I've seen that picture before. Really? Is that from the Seychelles? Or is it the mm. Caribbean? I've seen it before, but I can't remember. That was in the big period about 10 years ago when everyone was shooting uh, uh, photos at the surface with uh, the over remote cameras. Yeah, oh, the yeah. over-unders. In the Caribbean, maybe the Bahamas then. That's actually from Evan. That's Evan? <laughs> yeah, that's Evan. When did he ever have a wide angle lens? Unbelievable. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> it's Micronesia. Ah, oh yeah, Yap probably. 
Yeah, this is so smart to have the signature down there. <laughs> Great. That's Mr. Greg. Greg, amazing idea. And it's a sloth as well, I'm guessing, in the Amazon. Yeah, that's in Brazil. There we go. Ah, that's Tim Ho, isn't it? No. No? Not Reverse too. ring macro. Oh, Imran. Yes, that's Imran Ahmad. Yeah. Good one. Reverse yeah. ring macro. That's too artistic for me. I'm into the technical stuff. Mm -hmm. So what is it? It's a frogfish. Yeah, what kind of yeah. frogfish? Painted. Black Painted spotted frogfish. Painted frogfish? Yeah, sometimes I have the feeling they just name it like, like yellow spotted frogfish it's an, with I mean, blue eyes. The technique <laughs> is interesting. I mean, he's got the eye in focus and it looks great, but it's basically putting a lens on backwards yeah. and destroying the image as much as possible to be creative. Well, well, I mean, it but works. It's, it's a nice picture. Yeah, I like it works. It. But I couldn't do like a week of doing that. I'd go crazy. <laughs> That's how different photographers have that different thing that they like. They go down these routes. But yeah, it's yeah. cool. We're going to have Imran here oh, okay. uh, later this week. Uh, that's hmm. in Mexico again. It's somebody shooting uh, sea lions before <coughs> they go out to see the, the great white sharks, I guess. Yeah, that's a... Uh, California sea lion? Or yeah, a, no. California sea lion. Shot by Inca Creswell. That's our upcoming marine biologist yeah. filmmaking girl that just starting her career. Ah, cool. Ooh, ouchie. It's a shark that's been mating. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it a thresher? No, it looks it's like a, a thresher with the eye. Oh, blue shark. So mm -hmm. Somewhere in the Azores, I guess. Yes. But I wouldn't know Nuno who. Nuno is the photographer. Ah, okay. Great. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, we burned, our, we burned all but of our time. Before we end, Flo, uh, this is one of the first times we've had someone yeah. who's on the live stream as well as in the audience, and oh, they had no. a question. So oh. I was wondering, Ooh. maybe it's better if they just ask the question yeah, of course. Yeah. If you have a so mic Marta, here. if you can find Mr. Let me find the name. Darius Northman. If you're, there we go. There's the man. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, I have a quick question. Is this a, also a technicality for a black water photo? Um, huh? um, I'm not a Nikon user. So like uh, I'm using Sony, so I'm stuck with a 90 mil option. Like what, yeah. is, the, what is the challenges on um, shooting with longer lens on black water diving. And uh, my second question is that um, I feel like in underwater macro photography, there's, there's a curve how techniques getting improvised more and more mm -hmm. as well. You have the reverse ring macro, you have snoot lightning, you have everything else that also coming. And now also the black water diving. Yep. What is next, you think? <laughs> well, I'll start with the Sony question. Um, I am I've not someone who's been able to get along with the Sony cameras for still photographs. I have a couple of guests who use them and like them just because they keep going at it and they get used to the technique. But yeah, shooting with a longer lens, I used to do that on my 1DX using 100mm because Canon don't have a uh, full frame macro 60mm. Uh, it's just harder. You can try putting a plus 5 diopter on to get a bit closer because it's not so much the focus is bad, it's the distance you are away from the subject. Um, Depending on your budget, some people end up buying a Nikon D500 just for blackwater diving and then use their Sony for the other dives. So, <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> that, that's a rough one. Um, and then with regards to trends in diving, what's coming up next? Um, I don't know. It depends what somebody makes. Like snoots are coming back. Uh, Backscatter just brought out that little snoot strobe that they've made out. I think that's going to be the next little phase for the next year maybe. Um, because shooting with snoot with a torch, you change the behavior of the animal because it's sort of like, ah, I'm getting lit up. So maybe that'll make a comeback with the snoots. Um, but hopefully, I mean, people, if, as long as people are enjoying their diving and having fun, it doesn't really matter as long as nobody's getting hurt. So hopefully there'll be something new. There was the, the twinkly backgrounds made a little brief uh, come, st come through last year, maybe. But I think that's, that's done with, hopefully. <laughs> the amount of time you see people putting glitter backgrounds behind subjects as you're yeah, swimming around on a dive site. It's uh, not for me, but anyway. Okay. So yeah, I don't know, basically. <laughs> you good? Awesome. Yeah. Anyone else? Now is the time. Otherwise, thanks a lot. Simon. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you very much. You here. Really uh, inspiring what you do there. Thanks cool. a lot. Thank you. Thanks, man. No worries. That was a lot of fun. And Thank we are you. not sure what we're going to do next. 
Did you uh, stop it already? No? Okay, we're, so we're not sure what we're going to do next because Andrew Marriott, who's supposed to be here next, uh, probably can't make it. We're probably going to do a little Skype with him and ask him why, and then we probably do a question and answer within the Behind the Mask family because there's also like thousands of questions about uh, directing towards us. So let's see what we're going to do. Um, but thanks a lot, Simon. And we're out for another 45 minutes and then... Let's see what we're going to do then. <laughs>